So I'm kind of out of practice almost because last week I was doing a wedding and I was away in Ontario. And the week before that, I was in Kelowna at the Kelowna conference. And for those of you who were there, um, it was great. And for those of you who weren't there, it was great. <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot of us, right? And that's what's great about conferences. You get to see that how many of us there really are and uh, what it's like to be in a little microcosm example of a world that works for everyone. That's what's so fascinating about it is you get to see how people kind of work together. So I know that while I was away, um, Reverend Laura Lee, who I did get to connect with at the conference, um, she was here and she talked to you about the four agreements and she talked to you about the third one, which I believe is don't make assumptions. Is that correct? That's what she worked on? Great. And so uh, just as a reminder, the other two of the four agreements or the other, the other two that we've covered were be impeccable with your word, which is a super important one. And the other one is don't take anything personally. So if you think about both of those two and then don't make assumptions, uh, they're pretty powerful, each and every one of them. But this last one, is like the mother of all of the four agreements. So this last one is always do your best. And what Don Miguel Ruiz says is that when we are in, in a place of always doing our best, we can kind of cut ourselves a little bit of slack. He's not saying that they're not important, but if we're always doing our best, we're not going to have to worry so much about be impeccable with your word because we're doing our best. So maybe today, not quite so impeccable, but I was tired, I was whatever, not to make excuse, excuses, just to accept that that's the reality of my headspace today, and yet I am still as conscious as I can be about my word. So this is not a thing where we are in a place of trying to beat ourselves up, right? Um, oh, I made an assumption about that. Now I'm going to beat myself up. Was I doing my best, given what was happening in my awareness, in my sphere, in my day? Was I able to do my best? Did I deliver the best that I was able to do? And we're human. So some of these other little elements will ebb and flow. But if that's our highest value, then over a period of time, those other por portions of our experience will gradually rise up and be more in alignment than they previously were. Do you see, see how that works? So you're always working towards the good, the good, the good, the good, and by being aware, we catch ourselves more quickly when we're not as impeccable with our words. We catch ourselves quickly when, or more quickly, when we maybe are taking something personally. It's like, oh darn, I forgot that one again. But I'm still doing my best, and even doing my best may be, I, st I remember the four agreements. I remember one of the four agreements. That helps me to do my best. So there's a little bit of a story that he has here, and I'm hoping that um, Alan will uh, because it's a meditation story. So I'm sure that Alan will be listening with very close ears. But it's a meditation story done from the point of view of uh, a Toltec master who sees the world in a slightly different philosophical way. So the novice comes to the master and says, if I meditate for four hours a day, how long will it take me to transcend? And the master says, well, Maybe 10 years, maybe 10 years. And so then the novice says, okay, okay, I got it, I got it. So if I meditate for eight hours a day, how long is it gonna take me to transcend? And the master says, probably 20 years. And so the novice goes, I don't, like, I don't get it. How come, how come it's more, you know, I'm doing more, I'm more devoted than I was before, why? He says, if you can do your best in the first two hours of your meditation, or four hours, four hours a day, right? If you do your best, though, even in your first two hours of meditation, and the rest of your meditation, you're tired, you're starting to feel like you're sacrificing your life, you're getting exhausted, it will take you longer. Focus on the quality of what it is that you are doing 
and you will transcend that much more quickly. Interesting way of looking at things. So he says, do your best and you will learn that no matter how long you meditate, you can have a happy life. So I know this might go counter to Ellen. But <laughs> 20 minutes, 20 minutes, 25 minutes. <laughs> But you see what the point is, right? It's about trying to do your best and recognizing when you are in that consciousness of best. So what happens to me when I'm in a place where I'm really focused and I know that I'm doing my best and then I start to get into a place of now I'm driving myself. And a whole bunch of other things start to happen when we're doing that. One of the things that happens for me is that I start to lose my focus. And now I try and make myself regain my focus. And now I am unhappy with myself because my focus isn't what I think it should be. So now I've added another layer on there. And now, you know, the quality of my workmanship perhaps is now dropping. So I am no longer, I'm still focused on the task, but I am depleting my ability to do my best as I continue to go through it. So doing our best doesn't mean that we just keep going. Doing our best can also mean now is the time for us to release. Now is the time for us to take a break, a pause, perhaps meditate. <laughs> take that break and go back to it at a time when you feel more re-engaged. The other piece of it is recognizing that when we are doing our best, it's easier to do our best when we are doing things that we love. So there's a conscious awareness about recognizing how are we in that moment? How are we feeling in that moment? And do we want to continue to give that energy to something that we love? Or are we going to unplug from that? It's interesting because sometimes we have a whole list of things that are over here. You know, you think about the classic parent situation. The parent comes home. They love playing with their kids. But there's a, something else that they think they have to do, right? And so they go and do the thing that they have to do. And by the time they finish what they have to do, they're so tired, they don't have energy to do what they love, which is to play with their child. And they could perhaps have played with their child for 15 minutes and then still have had time to do the other things because they would be energized because they have now done what they love. There's a real interplay that happens with, that, with those kinds of things. So I had one instance of this this week. I was working on a um, project. Uh, it was a, a media release for home office. And um, at a, I was feeling a lot of pressure and I was feeling like I wasn't doing my best because I wasn't able to get to it as quickly and as efficiently as I thought I should. And then I heard that word should, right? So I was shooting on myself. And so then finally I did find the time to get into it. And then I realized I was truly doing what I loved because I lost all sense of time. I got completely immersed in it. I went into research. I got lost in my research. I got a great idea. I came back. I did some more writing. And I realized, oh, this just feels so good. It was a great, great thing. And so I ended up leaving that experience, feeling energized, and feeling like I was giving of myself. Because that's the other thing that happens when we do our best is we start to understand in a more deep way who we actually are. If we put together those pieces of what we love and then we give the most of who we are in that moment, it absolutely is a gift to a bigger consciousness. It has to be because you can tell the energy continues to grow and expand from that. And so Doing our best expands our ability to connect with others. It expands our ability to do what work we want to do. It expands our relationships. It expands so many different parts of our ability. So here's another example. Um, I don't really and ha didn't, there was a period of my time when, of my life when I was really 
bad at math, and I'm still kind of bad at math, but I can do rudimentary math. But my bad at math idea in my head was so strong that I avoided doing a lot of really boring things like budgeting. I hated doing budgeting. <laughs> and I didn't like keeping track of financial things and stuff like that because it had numbers attached to it. And then I worked for a financial management company. This was way back in the 1980s. And lo and behold, just because I was now, my job was to do that, and I wanted to do my best, I found that, well, you know what? I was actually kind of good at it. And I started doing what I did at work, and I brought it home. And lo and behold, I was balancing my checkbook at the end of every month, you know, back in the days when you actually did that kind of stuff, right? And it was really fascinating because I started to apply that principle of doing my best into my own life in an area that I didn't even think I had a best to do. And yet, there was more. There was more. There was an ability for me to just stretch myself beyond what I believed I up to that point was capable of doing. And then it, does it ever get juicy, right? Because now you've just proven to yourself that you're capable of far more than you thought you were. And so your best becomes a bigger container, which then allows you to give more to yourself and allows you to give more to others. So he says that your best is what actually gives you a full life. What he says is you will be productive. You will give of yourself to others. Your relationships will be strong. Your experience of life will be fulfilling. And you take action out of love without expectation of reward. That's a critical part of it. When we do our best, we don't do it because, like in the work situation, right? Because I wanted the boss to say, good little girl. <laughs> But in my own personal life, if I'm doing my best and I'm not expecting any kind of reward for it, I'm then able to expand and actualize myself in a far greater way. And that's what this teaching really is all about, is about that self-actualization piece and trying to figure out what that is. It gives us a chance to accept ourselves, gives us a chance to expand ourselves, gives us a chance to show up in the world in a bigger way. So I wanted to um, celebrate this by recognizing really in so many ways the qualities that you all have. And I know a couple of you are new, new and or new-ish here. So I'm just gonna hold you in that big container as if you've been here for like the last however many, two and a half years or something like that, right? So what we are always doing is we are, in our own small way, doing our best, and we're doing it either consciously or unconsciously. But every single one of you here has been showing up in your life in a different kind of way. You've been showing up in your life um, with all those relationships that I mentioned and all those qualities. And those qualities, when you walk in this door, they show up here too. You may not even be aware that those qualities of who you are are showing up. But that's partly what uh, Daryl was talking about when he was talking about the um, mental equivalent, is we walk around with our mental equivalent all the time. And whether we realize it or not, we are little broadcasting stations, and people around us can kind of resonate and tell who we are, and we get to receive all of that. But sometimes we don't even want to acknowledge the gifts that we already have. We poo-poo some of our gifts. We say, oh yeah, you know, I might be good at, I might be a really good artist, but nobody really cares about that, so that's really not important. And we poo-poo that. Those are divine gifts. Those are divinely given to us. And so the opportunity to recognize them means that we get to be that divine person that we already are and express from that. If we don't acknowledge those parts of ourselves, then we're denying our own God-given qualities. See how that works, right? So what um, Thomas Troward says is he says, and he's one of the people that we follow quite closely here, he says, never fear to be yourself. If mental science does not teach you to be yourself, it teaches you nothing. 
yourself, more yourself, and yet more yourself is what you want. Only with the knowledge that the true self includes the inner and higher self, which is always in immediate touch with the great divine mind. So we need that knowledge, we need to be conscious of it because that's when we get to expand it and to live from that. Thank <laughs> you.